Hello and good morning to you all from Vietnam. We're coming to you live from the Jeff Assembly. Um, this is a series of discussions looking into the global commons, the challenges they're being faced, and how to really ramp up uh, the, the agenda to help solve these challenges. Um, we're broadcasting live on Connect for Climate's Facebook page. Please engage in the discussion with hashtag Jeff Live. And to kick us off today on the third day of our live series, we've got uh, the honor of having Dominic Roy join us today. Dominic is from the WEF, from the World Economic Forum, and he's the head of international inst institutional agenda there. Thank you for joining us. So maybe just to get us started, the World Economic Forum is, is one of the forums that helps really drive the economic agenda of the world. Um, economics is so closely intertwined in the environmental agenda and increasingly we are realizing that um, well economics sits within the environment and economics and, and, and business action is key to solving some of our larger environmental issues and, and taking action on climate change. So maybe could you just explain a little bit the role of the WEF and how you're focusing on the global commons, um, how you're aiming to scale up uh, environmental solutions and, and uh, help tackle climate change? Delighted to do so. And um, it's a pleasure to be here in Da Nang at the sixth GEF assembly. So the World Economic Forum is the international organization for public-private cooperation. So if there are kind of wicked problems out there which require more than just a government or more than just an NGO or more than just one business to solve it. Um, the platform that the World Economic Forum offers helps to resolve those issues. So in the world things like um, the pay gap between genders, gender parity, or the future of jobs, uh, or issues of trade and how we can get the benefits from trade and not some of the risks, and of course the environment. Um, climate change, biodiversity, freshwater security, the oceans, all of these are good examples of wicked problems where there's so many people involved, lots of countries, but also lots of other stakeholders, lots of businesses use nature to derive a profit or to work in the environment um, and uh, bringing business and governments and the NGOs and scientists together to figure out what needs to be done is really what we do. Um, now, what's interesting is if you check out our 2018 Global Risks Report, you'll find it on the website wefforum.org, um, you'll see that the top global risks for 2018 identified by um, people in the risk profession, so uh, financial analysts and others, are all environmental risks. They're the failure to deal with climate change, they're the rising challenge of biodiversity and ecosystem collapse, they are freshwater crises, um, they are natural disasters, um, and they're all interconnected. Um, you know, food crisis, failing states, water crises, environmental crises. So these are the reasons why um, people who might not be in the environmental agenda are in the environmental agenda. Um, absolutely, because you really see that, you know, the environmental foundation is the drivers of prosperity, of, of economic gain. Um, so let's focus a little bit on, on, on the Jeff Assembly. We're here at the Jeff Assembly uh, where we're tackling the global commons. So what's, what's the role of the WEF here? What's your message to the uh, Jeff Assembly and, and how are you working with, with the partnership to help, help advance the agenda? Well, we've been really privileged as the World Economic Forum to work closely with the Global Environment Facility, particularly um, with the CEO and chairperson Naoko Ishii. Um, Naiko uh, approached us two and a half years ago in the run-up to what they call the Jeff 7 replenishment, where you've managed to get um, more developing development agencies put money into Jeff to support um, activities. Yeah. And her ask was quite simple. Can we get organizations who engage business to be behind the agenda of the GEF? And what's interesting about that is at the global commons level, as you've, as you've mentioned, often we think, well, there are international protocols like the Paris Agreement on Climate Change or lesser known ones like the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD, or the um, Convention on Desertification. Um, but if we believe the science, um, despite the existence of all of these protocols and arrangements, things aren't getting necessarily better. Emissions are going up. Uh, uh, more nature is being destroyed. 
So kind of something's not quite working. We have these great pieces of architecture, we have these protocols and arrangements, but they're not enough. So how to bring in then other stakeholders like investors or businesses to provide a new dimension to the challenge. And that's what we've been delighted to be able to do alongside other partners like the IUCN with their network of scientists or like the World Resources Institute with all of the analysis and um, NGO stakeholders. And together, the World Economic Forum, the IUCN, the World Resources Institute, the Stockholm Resiliency Center and the Global Environment Facility um, put forward this idea of a global commons initiative to have a, a new think about the new kinds of partnerships or collaborations we need to manage our global commons. And, and really using science as a foundation of that, to have these kind of science-driven targets as, as guiding principles to um, help rally all stakeholders and, and in particular business and, and the private sector. Um, so I'd like to pick up a little bit more on that, on, on the public-private collaboration and, and the need to include the private sector and investors as we go forward. So a lot of the discussion here is around transformative change. Um, we realize that the challenge uh, to solve some of these global uh, commons issues is way beyond the public sector. So what is the role of businesses? How can we get investors even more excited around uh, setting up new businesses, running or, or redirecting businesses to make them more in tune with maybe circular economy thinking or more in tune in, uh, with uh, a, a decarbonized, low, uh, resilient uh, kind of development strategy? What, how, how, where are the, the key areas that we can help create this excitement for the private sector? Yeah, it's interesting. So um, you're kind of looking for entry points, like kind of where will business play a role? And the, there's, an, in, there's two kind of ways to look at this. One is large projects, and the other is, you mentioned it on the investment side. Let's just start with the investment piece, because as you, as you know, right now we have this sort of battle royale that's taking place between those who see themselves as activist shareholders in companies who want to take money out as quickly as possible for a quick profit. And that's perfectly reasonable in many kind of capitalist societies and such. But then you have others in the investment community who see that you get better returns with a long run approach. And some of the better run um, more successful investment houses are getting better returns by taking a long-run approach. Um, so there are impact investment funds like Rise Fund, like TPG, even Larry Fink of uh, BlackRock, which is a pretty big investment house, wrote a very interesting letter talking about um, the returns are in the long run. And that is hugely interesting because some of the companies um, that we know of, uh, a Danone in France or a Unilever, um, or a Procter & Gamble, or even um, others we might not have heard of uh, within kind of supply chains, a DSM, which is a chemical company, um, a Mitsubishi. Many of these players, a Royal Dutch Philips, um, have to deal with that battle between investors in the short run and investors in the long run. Um, and if the first thing we can do is start to show that businesses will gain more money in the long run by taking long-term decisions, then everyone starts to get happy, including their pension funds and including the people who work for them. Um, Olam is a very good example of that. The chairman of Olam has been here. Uh, and he made a very strong case that actually you don't have to be um, an environmentally intelligent person to be an intelligent person about the environment. <laughs> right? So we can listen to the science um, but then we can react as um, other stakeholders um, to say, OK, so what we need to do is X, Y, Z. And examples like the circular economy yeah. provide very good practical areas for that action. Why would you make something? If I'm going to make a big piece of hospital equipment, very expensive. Um, I'm going to sell it to you. You are Here we are in Vietnam. You're Vietnam. Um, you're the chief purchaser of hospital equipment for Vietnam. Yeah. So this big scanning device is quite expensive. You've bought it and suddenly now it's yours. It's on your balance sheet. It's your asset. Yeah. After four years, it might be out of date. Yeah. So you need to buy another one. So I'll sell you another one. That's the old model. Yeah. I make some money. You have to pay a lot of money. You probably go to the World Bank or somebody for um, some um, financial support to buy it. Yeah. But every time it runs out, where does it go? 
onto a dump site or something. But inside it are all kinds of interesting pieces of cobalt and gold and silver and copper. And what if I didn't sell it to you, um, but I rented it to you? So I actually I give you a service of a hospital equipment. Um, and I guarantee that every time there's an update to it, new technology, I'll fix it and I'll improve it. And every time a piece wears out, I'll take it back and I'll give you a new piece. You win because you always get the best hospital equipment. I win because it saves me a lot of money to keep reusing the parts for other equipment rather than buying it always fresh raw materials. That's exactly the shift from product to service, which is happening in the circular economy, which has profound implications not just for the environment, but as we were saying, for business models. Exactly. And that's the interesting thing. And, and, and that is actually really where the excitement is, that businesses are shifting. They're innovating to redefine their business strategies to make it uh, more service orientated. We see it also in, in the transport sector where car companies are not only car companies, now they're actually transport service providers. Um, and, and, and this is the excitement. So. Um, maybe just to elaborate on, on that, to our youth audience, we're on Facebook Live. Um, how is that an opportunity for young people? How can they get involved in building this new uh, climate economy or this new sustainable future that is driven by uh, social enterprises, that is driven by um, uh, businesses that are environmentally and sustainably minded? Well, the first thing is actually it's a very, very exciting time to be I reckon between about like let's say 20 and 30 in this domain so I'm 48 so I'm kind of not 20 to 30 I wish I was um, but what has happened um, in the last five or six years is we've realized that um, and with the greatest respect to those in the international development space the answer to these problems is not going to come only from aid from the West going to poorer countries um, there's not enough taxpayers money to do that but also it stifles innovation. Um, this is just sort of grant off balance sheet money to keep things going. And we're seeing so many kind of new ideas emerging about how to clean plastics out of the ocean, how to have social enterprises that use apps and connect people up to micro banking. Uh, so many things that it's a great time to be an entrepreneur, a great time to be a young entrepreneur and a great time to be a young entrepreneur who could call on people like the Global Environmental Facility, United Nations Environment Programme, the World Bank, or leading business figures um, to ask for advice. And if you're interested in doing that, uh, I am sure that there's a hashtag or a way of getting in touch with the GEF assembly, but certainly kind of reach out to the worldeconomicforum.org, wefforum.org, because there's so much interest from those who are more experienced business people to really help invest in the entrepreneurship and the innovation that those, let's say, under 30 provide. We have a network which we call the Global Shapers. These are um, close to 10,000 people around the world in 400 cities um, who are engaged in exactly this kind of entrepreneurial, innovative activity. So wherever you are, just go onto our website and see if there's a Shapers hub in the city where you live, and that will get you into the ecosystem of innovation. And that, I would suggest, is very much the bright future of tomorrow. Absolutely. So you've heard it. Um, we get into the ecosystem of innovation. This is an exciting time where the economy is redirecting itself to really be in line with our environmental uh, challenges and help build that sustainable future. Thank you so very much for joining us here on the y uh, uh, GEF Live Series here in Vietnam at the Jeff Assembly. Thank you and have a good You're day. You're very welcome.